All right, my friends, welcome back. We're uh, going to continue on with carbohydrates today. And we've been talking about a particular one, and there's a little bit of, I would say, nomenclature that you need to be conversant in uh, in order to be prepared for biochemistry. So I'm going to walk you through that, and then we're going to talk about some interesting sugars. Last time uh, I drew this molecule for you. This is a six carbon sugar and I told you its name and again for the most part I don't worry about naming molecules but you're gonna encounter uh, these names in the future and so you should know about them. Uh, this molecule is called beta d glucopyranose and each part of this name has oops uh, has a meaning the os refers to carbohydrate things that are end in os are usually derived from carbohydrates so if you've heard of ribose in DNA or RNA, that's a carbohydrate. It's part of the DNA structure. The pyran part refers to the fact that this is a six-membered ring. That contains oxygen. And uh, together, the pyranose, uh, the pyran and the os communicate that this is a six-membered ring cyclic hemiacetal. And the carbon, number one, is the one that's bonded to an OR group and an OH group right? so that... Uh, Carbon-1 is the one that's involved in the hemiacetal. There's a hydrogen here, and we will call this carbon. Uh, we have a word for this carbon. It's the anomeric carbon, which just means it's the hemiacetal carbon. But you'll hear people use that uh, word. <clears throat> the cyclic form of glucose, as I think I mentioned last time, is in equilibrium with an open chain form, and the mechanism to get from the closed chain form to the open chain form is uh, just hemiacetalhydrolysis, which we talked about earlier in the semester, so you can go back and review that, and if it would be useful to you, try to draw the mechanism for this glucose molecule. Uh, your, the way to be successful in this part of the course is to be able to deal with large biomolecules by finding the relevant functional groups. Um, so if you had to draw a mechanism from here to here, you, need, you would need to look at what's changing recognize that you went from a hemiacetal to an aldehyde and then you would need to connect that to stuff you learned before only when you learned it before it looked like this right uh, and the difference is that the aldehyde and the alcohol are both in the same same carbon. Okay, um, now the open chain form is simply called D-glucose. So uh, where does the beta come from? And the beta refers to stereochemistry at carbon-1, stereochemistry at the anomeric carbon. If it's up, it's beta. If it's down, it's alpha. And actually, if we take this open chain form of glucose, 
rotate around the bond between carbons one and two, and then close up the cyclic hemiacetal again, we can get access to the other stereoisomer where the OH group is down. And this is called alpha D glucopyranose. And you can, uh, because you can open up either alpha or beta uh, stereoisomers to the open chain form, these two stereoisomers are actually in equilibrium with each other. So when you put glucose in aqueous solution, most of it is in the cyclic hemiacetal form, an equilibrating mixture of alpha and beta stereoisomers. All right, a um, couple of things. Uh, the beta and alpha stereoisomers differ in stereochemical configuration at one stereocenter, so it's appropriate to call them diastereomers. We will also use the term epimers to describe diastereomers that differ at only one carbon. And then uh, we can also use the term anomers to describe uh, epimers at the anomeric carbon. So uh, we will sometimes call this the alpha anomer and this the beta anomer. Okay, question so far. I haven't told you what the D and the gluco mean yet, but we've got the pyran, the os, and the beta. Yeah? Is there a reason why it's alpha and beta? Is there a reason why it's alpha and beta? Because, uh, because the way chemistry research and biology research happens, it's not like everybody gets down and decides what the smartest way to do things is. They just start naming stuff, and then after the fact, they get together and argue about what the smartest way to do things is, and then we cobble together a system. So I got nothing. <laughs> What's worse, and I, you won't be responsible for this at all, but organic chemists talk about sugars having different faces. You got the top face and the bottom face. We call the bottom face beta and the top face alpha, even though it's the alpha anomer where the OH group is down. So like, who knows? Um, other questions? Yeah. As you study all this, like what is a good thing? How do we know what to memorize and what to not? Uh, how do you know what to memorize versus what to not? Um, I will tell you. <laughs> so you will need to know that this structure is beta D-glucopyranose and that this structure is alpha D-glucopyranose. And you will need to know how they are different from just D-glucose. Um, all right, what does D refer to? Uh, D is another stereochemistry term. Um, sorry, I forget that I need to avoid red and green. We avoid red and green because a substantial portion of adults are red, green, colorblind. So when you're making scientific figures, it's really irritating if you make two lines, one is red and one is green, and you ask people to see the difference between the two. So just so you know. Um, D refers to stereochemistry at carbon five. And it is D if up. And if it's down, it's L. Now this uh, is an archaic form of stereochemical description. It was, uh, it was uh, generated way back in the day before people had crystal structures and way back before R versus S. Uh, it has nothing to do with whether or not the molecule rotates light in the clockwise versus counterclockwise direction. It's, uh, it's, and it's stereochemistry that's assigned by analogy to a standard molecule. So none of that's important, 
but knowing that when we say D glucose, the stereocenter, when we draw the molecule this way, is up. Now we could go ahead and assign R versus S at each of these carbons. I've done that before on 351 exams, and people hate it because it's kind of hard. But um, anyway, that's uh, and and we won't assign R versus S here. I have no I have no particular interest in that, um, but you'll see that in all the sugars we draw, the group on carbon five is equatorial up, and, uh, and that's why. Now, the other three stereocenters are accounted for, let's use purple, what are we gonna use now? Mm, this strange orange, darker orange. Gluco refers to stereochemistry at C1, I'm sorry, C2, C3, and C4. So, in the case of glucose, it's down, up, down. And so we will use the term gluco. Uh, and there are lots of, you know, there are eight different, no, sorry, two times two times two. No, it's eight different combinations, but we will only learn three of them. Um, all eight are discussed in your book, but I do not care about the other five. So, uh, and these are the ones you will encounter most in biology. So, gluco has down, up, and down. And honestly, glucose is easy to remember uh, because uh, everything from C2 on is all equatorial. And in the beta anomer, even carbon 1 is equatorial. So, if we switch the configuration at carbon 2 to up, and generate the up, up, down diastereomer. That's called, we, we will use the term mano. So uh, if I were to draw this molecule, and the OH on C2 is up, this would be beta D manopyranose. And then uh, similarly, if the stereochemistry was down, up, up, that would be galactose or galacto. Um, that comes from a Greek word for milk and lac galactose is part of a disaccharide that is in or a part of the disaccharide lactose which is found in milk and dairy products in galactose everything's the same as with glucose only c4 has the up oh group so this would be beta d galactopyranose Okay, uh, and notice that these three, glucose, beta D glucopyranose, beta D manopyranose, and beta D galactopyranose, are all epimers of each other. They differ at only one stereochemistry, so uh, at only one stereocenter. So you will hear people talk about beta D manopyranose as the C2 epimer of glucose or people will call galactose the C4 epimer of glucose. All right, so those are three different carbohydrates and it's easiest to remember them in relationship to glucose, right? Memorize the glucose structure and then for mannose and galactose, all you have to do is remember for mannose, it's the C2 epimer and for galactose, it's the C4 epimer and you just switch the stereochemistry. All right, questions? All right, uh, the equilibration of the beta anomer with the alpha anomer, this overall process is called muta rotation. Uh, and 
I don't know why, uh, except for the fact that I suppose that uh, if you don't know anything about chemistry, um, that it looks that you could go from the beta anomer to the alpha anomer by sort of twisting these groups around. But you need to break bonds in order for that to happen. And the fact that carbon-1 is a hemiacetal means that breaking bonds is, is a possibility there. So you can interchange between alpha and beta anomers. Now, I want to talk about that because it gives us a chance to think critically about sterics and other electronic factors. So I'm going to draw those two anomers of glucose again. Oh, shoot. No, that's fine. Let's just do it. Um, the beta anomer and the alpha anomer, and they're in equilibrium with each other. Now, based on 351 intuition, when you learned about chair conformations, which of these two anomers, beta or alpha, do you expect to be more stable? Beta. And that's right. Why is it more stable? Sterics, right? You've got, and these were the so-called 1-3 diaxial interactions. The axial OH group bumps into axial protons on the same side of the ring. Um, and so, yes, you would expect the alpha anomer to be less stable than the beta anomer because of sterics. Um, and you may not have learned this in 351, but we can put a number on that. Uh, there are these things called A values, which tell you in terms of energy, how bad is it to have a group axial versus equatorial. Got ahead of myself. Uh, and so A values are given in kilocalories per mole. And for the OH group, the A value is 1 kcal per mole. And uh, we can use a gen chem relationship. I told you you'd only really have to subtract and add and maybe divide by 2. And that's true, so I'm going to do the math for you. I've done it previously. I cannot do exponentials in my head. You would predict, based on this number, you would predict if sterics were the only thing to see 75% beta anomer and 25% alpha anomer. Okay? But in reality, what we actually observe is 67% beta and 33% alpha, which means that the alpha anomer is not as bad as we expect in terms of stability. Or we could say it is unexpectedly stable. It's not more stable than the beta anomer, but it is more stable than we thought it was going to be. And so in, in OCHEM we have a an old adage that is, if you're, trying to, if, if you're trying to explain something and if it's not sterics, it's probably something to do with electrons and orbitals. If it's not sterics, it's electronics. Uh, so, you know, now uh, if you're in your recitation section and, and you're asked a question and somebody says, what's the explanation? And you try sterics and the TA says, no, you can then say electronics and you'll probably be right. But they may want something more specific than that. I don't know. Uh, so I want to take just a minute and describe what electronic factors make the alpha anomer more stable. This is going to involve orbitals, and it's going to involve something uh, that I usually teach in 351. So I'm not going to do it in a lot of depth. You're not going to have to answer questions about it in a lot of depth. But I want you to be. Uh, I want you to have seen this before. Uh, so let's talk about why the alpha anomer is unusually or unexpectedly stable. 
and we're going to focus on carbon-1 and its OH group and the oxygen attached to carbon-1. That oxygen has two lone pairs. Uh, and it's generally uh, okay to think of them as equivalent to each other, as though they were in sp3 type orbitals. Uh, evidence suggests that that doesn't have to be the case, but we'll sort of go ahead and operate on that assumption. Here is the uh, lone pair, here is the atomic sp3 orbital as it were, that we're saying this lone pair on oxygen is in, okay? That just looks like, you know, when you learned about sp3 orbitals, they look like that, right? The, the color represents the sign of the wave function, and where the color switches, there is a node. Now, we're going to now draw the antibonding orbital, the empty antibonding orbital associated with the carbon-oxygen sigma bond, and we will call this the sigma star, the carbon-oxygen sigma star. Have you been, uh, have I talked to you before, have you learned before about the concept of antibonding orbitals? A little bit. When you make a bond, uh, conceptually you can think of that as overlapping two atomic orbitals, and you add them together, and you make a bonding orbital that's more stable than the two starting orbitals. But the math of MO theory requires you, if you're going to add, you also have to subtract. And so you also generate an antibonding orbital where you subtract one from the other, and that's higher in energy than the starting uh, orbitals. So um, whereas if we were to draw up the bonding orbital for this bond, it would have a lobe mostly in between the two nuclei and smaller lobes out here, the antibonding orbital is quite different the antibonding orbital has its larger lobes out here pointing away from the space between the two nuclei, and then it has smaller lobes pointing towards the middle, and there is a wave function sign switch in the middle between the two nuclei so that there's a node. Uh, and if you were to populate this orbital, electrons in it would tend to be pulling the two nuclei apart, which is one of the reasons why it's called an antibonding orbital. So you have this uh, lone pair here, and then and it's relatively high in energy because it's not involved in a bond, and then you have an antibonding carbon-oxygen sigma star that is empty. Now, in organic chemistry, whenever you have a carbon, um, whenever you have a filled orbital that is adjacent to and lined up with an empty orbital, something can happen that's called hyperconjugation. And this may be a new concept. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it. As I said, I'm not, going to, uh, I'm not going to push you a lot on explaining things based on hyperconjugation. But it's, a, it's useful. And if you want to know more about how it can explain uh, trends that you learned about in 351, uh, we can talk about that some other time. But this is when a filled orbital overlaps with an empty orbital on an adjacent atom in the same molecule. And the effects of this are that uh, the electrons in the filled orbital get to delocalize or spread out in energy, and that makes them more stable. They get to spread out in space, which makes them more stable or lower in energy. All right, so because if we were to look down this bond in a Newman projection, you would see how the yellow lobe on the lone pair overlaps with the yellow lobe on the sigma star. We can donate electron density into there that spreads out the lone pair and makes, uh, makes it more stable. So presumably that stabilizing effect offsets a little bit, the destabilizing effect of having the OH group 
axial. And this effect where the alpha anomer is a little bit more stable than you would expect is called the anomeric effect. And it's one of the cool little evidences that these types of orbital interactions happen within molecules. So the take home message is the alpha anomer is a little bit more stable than you would expect because when the OH group is axial, its antibonding orbital lines up with the adjacent lone pair, and that allows the lone pair to spread out a little bit. Okay, questions about that? Yeah? So is that If the if if you didn't have the oxygen here with lone pairs, there you would you would expect to see this ratio. Yeah. What else? Yeah. Um, so it's because that OH group is uh, axial instead of equatorial that the uh, antibonding orbital can I guess be in the correct orientation. That's overlap. that's correct. It's because the OH group is axial that it can overlap. Its antibonding orbital can overlap with the lone pair on oxygen. It's difficult to see, and again, this point isn't a major one. I'm just mentioning it for because uh, it may be helpful to some of you. In the axial configuration, the antibonding orbital is going to be pointing away from, or at least perpendicular to, the lone pair. And when two orbitals, when the lone pair is perpendicular to the sigma star, there's no interaction. Okay, what else? Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's an interesting question. If you're putting electrons in an antibonding orbital, won't it decrease stability? Um, it does make the carbon-oxygen bond a little longer. Uh, but remember, stability is only ever determined by filled orbitals. Empty orbitals are there, but they don't matter until, they're, until they have electrons in them. The interaction I'm describing, you can envision as a sort of pseudo-bonding interaction between the antibonding orbital that's quite high in energy and the lone pair that's quite low in energy. When they overlap, you actually just make a new, slightly delocalized lone pair orbital, and those move down in energy. And then you make a new, slightly delocalized sigma star, which moves up in energy. And it's true, you make the antibonding orbital less stable, but that doesn't matter. So all that matters is that the electrons move down in stability. Um, the way I've described it here is more qualitative. This picture is more technically accurate, and, and it comes from quantitative uh, MO theory considerations, but we don't need to worry about that in a lot of detail. What else? Okay, so I, I hate what I'm about to do. But I'm, about, I'm going to do it anyway because I'm not going to test you on it, but you will see it in biochemistry, and I don't want you to be confused. So uh, understand that I'm sort of closing my eyes and holding my nose as I tell you all of this. Because the way I have been drawing glucose for you is uh, a way that accurately de depicts its three-dimensional conformation. But you will see uh, people draw glucose in different ways, especially in biology and biochemistry texts. Um, not, I mean, if we want to be mean, maybe it's because they don't think they can uh, draw chairs, but um, <laughs> it may be more that they're just trying to simplify and avoid unnecessary confusion. Nevertheless, uh, what they will tend to do, do is draw a six-membered ring as a flat hexagon. And then they will represent stereochemistry at each of these carbons. At carbons one, two, three, three, and four, and at five. Uh, by using straight lines up and down. So for the beta-D-glucopyranose, we would have 
an up OH group on carbon 1 and a down proton on carbon 1. Then on carbon 2, we would have a down OH group and an up hydrogen. On carbon 3, we would have an up OH group and a down hydrogen. And on carbon 4, we would have a down OH group and an up hydrogen. And then on carbon 5, we would have this up uh, CH2OH group with a down hydrogen. That's okay, though it tells you nothing about the actual shape of the sugar. And if you envision sugar as a flat little hexagon floating around, I suppose that's no more damaging than many of the other things that we think about life, so go for it. Um, <laughs> this is called the Hayworth projection. And at least it represents the majority cyclic form of glucose. Uh, now... Uh, you will also see a depiction of the linear structure of glucose, which uh, you can draw simply based on the chair structure by opening up the cyclic hemiacetal and putting the aldehyde on carbon-1. And this works out okay. Uh, and if you wanted to, uh, you could sort of rotate around this carbon-carbon bond between 4 and 5 in a way that would bring this CH2OH group over here. Uh, and if we did that, if we rotated in that way, and you may have to make a model to convince yourself that this is the case, uh, we would put CH2OH here and then the OH group on carbon-5 would be down. So those two are equal to each, uh, equivalent to each other. We have just sort of adjusted the way we've drawn it. You can do the same thing with this horrible Hayworth projection. Horrible? No, I'm sorry. I probably shouldn't be such a jerk about stuff. Um, <laughs> That could apply in lots of areas of my life. I shouldn't be a jerk. Um, okay, so you can simply show the cyclic hemiacetal form, or sorry, break apart the cyclic hemiacetal form. Carbon-1 becomes an aldehyde, which they will typically represent with CHO, but that just means this. And then, again, if you rotate around the bond between... Um, four and five, you can arrange things so that the CH2OH is here, pointing to our right, and the OH group would be down, and then we can draw sort of the rest of our hexagon like this. Okay, so that's the open chain form. And now we're going to sort of unroll this and straighten it out. And we'll do this by drawing a straight line between the CHO group and then the CH2OH group on the other carbon. And then we'll draw lines where there are carbons one, or uh, sorry, two, three, four, and five. So at carbon two, we have an OH group here. At carbon three, we would have the OH at the sort of up position. At carbon four, we would have the OH at the down position. And at carbon five, we would have the OH at the down position. So see how much we've lost in terms of uh, representation by going from this to this. Um, unless you know where this came from, you suddenly aren't even sure what the stereochemistry is at each of those atoms. Uh, and then the last thing we're going to do is rotate uh, counterclockwise by 90 degrees to put CHO at the top 
CH2OH at the bottom, and then four other lines. Uh, at two, the OH would be on our right. At four and five, the OH would be on our right. And at three, the OH would be on our left. And then you draw in the other hydrogens. And this is the so-called Fischer projection of D-glucose. And you will see this in biochem texts. And um, a student asked during the 9 o'clock class, well, couldn't I just take the mirror image of that and flip it over, and wouldn't it be the same thing? And the answer is exactly, unless you know what this figure means. Uh, and that's one of the problems with drawing it this way. But if you wanted to convert this back into a dashes and wedges figure, uh, you would, all of the bonds that are vertical would be dashes, and all of the bonds that are horizontal would be wedges. So we're looking at an sp3 hybridized carbon, but from a perspective that we don't normally use. We're sort of looking at it on its edge. And uh, it would be really hard to actually conceive of the molecule actually adopting this shape. So this shape is not meant to demonstrate the conformation of the sugar. It's mostly meant to demonstrate stereochemistry. And one of its main uses is just to show the difference between glucose and uh, its other stereoisomers. So I could draw real quickly an additional Fisher projection where I change the stereochemistry at carbon four. This would be D galactose. And uh, presumably in this way, it's easy to see that D galactose and D glucose are C4 epimers. I will not test you on this, but you will see it in your future. And when you do, you can come back to these notes and remind yourself what things really are. Okay. Um, because in, your, in addition to the Holy Spirit, your OCHEM notes describe things as they really are. Okay. Well, at least as well as we understand them. And even then, sometimes it's oversimplified. So whatever. Okay, any questions about that? All right, if you have to memorize Fisher projections someday, I'm sorry, good luck to you, but uh, now you will know where they came from. So, yes? So for the Fisher projection, the wedges go back to the phase, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, if you think about that, this is a good question. It's like the sugar structure is curving away from you. It's almost like it's placed around the edge of a cylinder. And your text talks about that in some detail. I just really don't care enough. But I wanted you to, to see where it comes from. Okay, so now uh, we're going to talk about uh, some chemistry of sugars. And uh, we'll start with making acetals out of the sugar hemiacetals. But we're going to use a different word to describe uh, sugar acetals. They're going to be called glycosides. So the simplest glycoside would be if you were to take a sugar and like glucose, a beta D-glucopyranose or just D-glucopyranose, and then uh, expose it to a different alcohol under uh, acidic, catalytic acidic conditions. Um, I am going to, instead of drawing uh, either an up OH group or a down OH group at carbon one, I'm going to use a squiggly line here, which communicates that I have both alpha and beta anomers. Because of course, if I just dissolve glucose in water, that's what I have. 
Now, there are chemical ways that you can isolate one beta, a beta anomer versus an alpha anomer, and in that case, you would show the actual stereochemistry. But if you mean to communicate, you have both diastereomers. The squiggly line is sort of the best you can do in the chair. If we were to take this and expose it to an alcohol, say methanol, in catalytic acid, say toluene sulfonic acid, or HCl would be okay too, you're going to take this hemiacetal and you're going to convert it into an acetal in which we replace the OH group with a methoxy group. So chemically, this is one way you can treat the OH group on carbon-1 differently than all the other OH groups, because none of the other OH groups are at uh, an acetal carbon. Now the mechanism for this may look uh, confusing, and uh, a tendency among students, and one of the hardest parts of this section on biomolecules is that uh, is to retain focus on what matters and not be distracted by large structures. So uh, let me show you what this reaction would look like if we were doing it, drawing it uh, or using simpler molecules as we did earlier in this semester. The hemiacetal we could draw like this. We would have the same conditions. And then uh, we would make the regular acetal, uh, well, let me just be general, like this. And the mechanism for that would be uh, actually pretty straightforward, right? If you go back and look at what you did in those early chapters, we would first protonate the OH group to turn it into a good leaving group. Then electrons on the oxygen can kick down and kick off water. Now this, at this stage, should be comforting to some of you. It should sound uh, soothing and familiar, and some of you may be even drifting off to sleep because now you you use my uh, OCAM videos as white noise as you're falling to sleep. <laughs> and then the OH group attacks. <laughs> Breathe in. <laughs> Exhale as you imagine. The, any, sorry. Um, <laughs> so then uh, we get this intermediate where the incoming alcohol is still protonated and some base, usually the conjugate base of our acid, removes that proton and that gets us to the acetal. Now, um, I want you later on to draw the mechanism up here based on what I drew below with this molecule until you know and can convince yourself that it's just this. This is going to help you work on the skill of ignoring what you can ignore and focusing in on what's important. As we go from here to here, we can ignore the ring and the other OH groups and just focus in on uh, the chemistry at the anomeric carbon. All right. So uh, the methoxy group is boring. So I want to talk about other more interesting glycosides. And uh, glycosides form, as I said, when we take an alcohol and convert the hemiacetal into an acetal. Well, sugars are replete with alcohol, so what if we use another sugar? So let's imagine that we take two molecules of glucose. <clears throat> and what I will describe now is an enzyme-catalyzed enzyme reaction, so you aren't going to need to worry about... Um, why it ends up the way it does, but you should be able to draw a mechanism if I ask you to. You take two sugars, here's the hemiacetal, and then we're going to use on carbon one of the first sugar, and then we're going to use the OH group on carbon four of the other sugar, and we'll uh, 
we could use an enzyme to use acid-base catalysis to connect, to have, uh, to kick off this OH group as water to generate an oxonium ion, and then this alcohol attacks. But after that, you would have the following structure. And uh, if that overwhelms you, then uh, take a minute later on to convince yourself that what you're seeing is really just that. Here is the acetal functional group, carbon one bonded to two oxygens, where those oxygens are alcohols. Now, we'll have a specific way about talking about this glycoside because the acetal links two sugars together. And we will call the linkage between the two sugars a glycosidic linkage. And we're going to need a couple of things to describe it. We're going to need uh, numbers to describe which carbons are linked together. And then we're going to need beta versus alpha to describe the configuration of this stereocenter. So the linkage here is between uh, an up, the, the linkage here involves the oxygen in the up position. So this is a beta linkage and it connects carbons one on carbon one on one sugar with carbon four on the other sugar. Now the full name of this would include both of these other sugars so that you would know exactly the structure of the rest of the molecule, but focusing in on the linkage we would call this a beta-1,4 glycosidic linkage. And the structure I've draw drawn for you here is cellobios, which is a subunit of cell walls for plants. This is, a, this is a subunit of fiber, and if you were to continue to have other uh, another sugar linked beta-1,4 here and another there and on forever, you would get uh, the carbohydrates, uh, cellulose, the carbohydrate that's involved in plant cell walls. Now, uh, a little stereochemistry can make a big difference because if we take the same two sugars and link them together, uh, still carbons one and four, but instead of being beta, we have the oxygen on carbon one down, then we've got this type of linkage, which we would call an alpha-1,4 linkage. You will hear that terminology in biochemistry. And this uh, glycoside or disaccharide is called maltose. And that's a component, that's a subunit of starch and alpha-1,4 linkages between glucose molecules are also found in glycogen. Glycogen's a little bit more complicated because often there's another sugar attached in an alpha linkage to the OH on carbon-6. So glycogen is heavily branched and has both alpha-1,4 and alpha-1,6 linkages. Um, we can digest this. If you suck on a saltine, and I don't know why you'd want to do that, but if you do, eventually you're going to start to taste some sweetness, and that's actually glucose being liberated. Uh, and the way it gets liberated is you have enzymes that break apart starch into smaller pieces, and then you just need to hydrolyze the, the acetal. We don't have enzymes to hydrolyze this beta-1,4 linkage between glucose molecules, which is why on your food labels you can see that uh, fiber is included under carbohydrates, but it doesn't increase the calories because we don't metabolize um, fiber. All right, that's about enough for today. We'll maybe do a little bit more with disaccharides on Monday and then move on to the next chapter. I know I'm late with study guides. I'll get them up as soon as I can. I see a question. Yeah.